for uh, joining uh, this um, presentation. Uh, we are delighted to have um, Dr. Chris Funk talk today. He is the director of the Climate Hazard Center at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. And uh, Chris works on in, with an international team of our scientists on weather and famine related disaster responses. And works closely with USAID and NASA on these issues. Um, he studies climate and climate change and uh, developing improved data sets and monitoring prediction systems. Um, he wrote a book in 2020, published a book in 2020 on drought early warning and forecasting. And he has a new book that will come out in August uh, titled Drought, Flood, Fire, How Climate Change Contributes to Recent Catastrophes. Um, so really pleased to have Chris today and thank you so much for uh, taking the time. So go ahead, Chris. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much, Bridget, for this, this opportunity to, to talk with all of you. And uh, we're going to talk today about how to translate the fingerprints uh, of climate change into uh, more effective early warning. Um, I'm the director here at the Climate Hazard Center. And one of the really unique things uh, about our group is that, that we have uh, a team of international field scientists um, that work in Kenya, Ethiopia, uh, Southern Africa, Niger, and Central America to um, do drought early warning and food security analyses to support the US Agency for International Development's Famine Early Warning System Network. Uh, this was an activity that began after the horrible famine in 1984 in Ethiopia and Sudan. And today, uh, we, uh, you know, we being a, a lot of people, <laughs> uh, track food insecure conditions and try to provide that information so that famines don't happen. Um, and uh, kind of backstopping uh, our, our field scientists uh, are, is a team of uh, uh, researchers, programmers, graduate students um, here at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So just to kind of quickly tell the, the life story, um, basically in 1997, I was uh, lucky enough to kind of show up here at uh, UC Santa Barbara and start working on uh, my master's degree uh, on spatial interpolation, basically taking, you know, observations at weather stations and creating continuous grids of data from that. And uh, I was also really interested in uh, modeling um, rainfall in the mountains. And sort of along the bottom here, I just have some maps of uh, precipitation um, in Eastern Africa to kind of contextualize things. Um, and so uh, in, in 1999, our ability to produce a, a map like that shown in the bottom left, you know, we didn't have that capability. So we were really, um, you know, kind of working in the dark. And uh, with my advisor, Greg, sorry, Joel Michelson and my colleague, Greg Husak, when I graduated with my PhD, uh, we founded the Climate Hazard Group. And in 2004, uh, I discovered uh, the decline in the Ethiopian rainfall that we'll talk about later. And this kind of got me uh, working in the field of climate change, um, not really by intent, but just, um, you know, because climate change appeared to be hurting the people that I was working to protect, uh, that got me involved. Um, in the kind of late 2000s, uh, we started working towards integrated uh, um, observational data sets and forecasts. And the kind of work still goes on a pace, but the idea is that you wanna be able to take uh, high quality gridded estimates of things like rainfall and forecasts of rainfall and, and put them together in interoperable ways. And uh, our analysis of the climate trends that began in around 2004 uh, led to uh, a FuseNet alert in August of 2010, um, where we warmed of back-to-back -back droughts in October, November, December, and March, April, May of 2010 and 2011 which uh, unfortunately came to pass. And um, due to 
you know, a problem of an inadequate response, but also militants in Somalia. Uh, there was widespread famine. Uh, we, you know, worked on trying to understand the role of teleconnections in driving East Africans extreme. And uh, we linked the droughts in Ethiopia and Southern Africa in 2015-16 to climate change enhanced El Nino impacts, which we'll talk about later. Um, then when there was the next La Nina, uh, we did a very good job of predicting back-to-back -back droughts in 2016-17. Then uh, we did that again in 2020, 2021, and are doing it again, probably for 2021, 22. So <laughs> that's my history as an early warning scientist uh, told as a series of East African droughts. And so as we kind of go from the left to the right, you know, there's been a tremendous uh, increase in our uh, data products and our forecast capabilities. Um, but most of what I'll talk about today is sort of climate change and how understanding climate change informs our early morning process. Uh, oh, so these are just showing the, the most of these droughts are either associated with La Nina's and El Nino's, and we'll talk about that in a second. So uh, as Bridget mentioned, I'm just releasing this book, uh, Drought, Flood, Fire. Um, you know, as I was working on this, it seemed kind of like an esoteric topic. I didn't know if anybody would care. Now it just seems like maybe the book is so boring because we're just experiencing, you know, these extremes like almost on a, on a daily basis. Um, and uh, just a few points about what we've seen just really over the last month and then this month. You know, most of the Western US faces extreme drought conditions. Uh, British Columbia on June 30th experienced the hottest temperatures ever, ever, uh, and then the town burned down. Um, extreme heat uh, has led to deaths in, or in uh, Vancouver, in Oregon, and Washington. Um, rapid climate change assessments uh, indicate that climate change made these extremes about 150 times more likely, uh, with the quote being, uh, Western North American extreme heat was virtually impossible without human-induced climate change. And uh, ex those uh, uh, extremely warm sea surface temperatures in the Northern Pacific helped kill a billion marine animals, mostly mussels. So it's you know, it's not like there are million dead sea otters or something, but but it's a big environmental disruption. Uh, in California, the 2020 wildfire season uh, was incredibly extensive, burning more than 4 million acres, twice the previous record in 2018. Uh, so far, we appear to be on pace uh, with 2020. We'll see. Um, and if you look at dead fuel moisture levels across the Western US, they are extremely low. And I think we're all bracing for a, a really another bad fire season in the West, which is already starting to play out. Uh, state average data for Oregon, Washington, Arizona, and California definitely show that June 2021 was the warmest or second warmest month on record, um, about plus five to plus seven warmer than the 1981 to 2010 average. Before 2010, warm Junes were about three degrees Fahrenheit above normal. So, you know, we're already appearing, you know, seem to be seeing this jump to, you know, much more extremes just in the last 10 years. Uh, here on the bottom left is just the current map uh, from NOAA of US $2021 billion weather and climate disasters. Uh, Texas wins. We've had a severe weather uh, in April, hailstorms, uh, and then flooding in Louisiana. Um, but you know these, uh, you know, billion dollars disasters in the U.S. You know are totaling, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars each year. You know, since 2015, um, and at the same time, uh, globally we see this big increase in the number of uh, food insecure people, perhaps tripling or more. You know, so in 2015, the assessments by the famine early, famine early warning systems network were about 33 uh, extremely hungry people, people that need food aid. And the projection for 2021 is 92. So we've seen almost a threefold increase. And we now have a huge number of food insecure people uh, we are 
getting assistance to a lot of those people. And uh, Bridget, you and I were just chatting about this before the talk. You know, we're also seeing a lot of extreme uh, hydroclimatic shots flooding. And if you go and you look in um, reinsurance company data, these are companies that insure the insurers. You see uh, weather hazards are really jumping up in terms of losses. And uh, again, I already talked about this number of food insecure. So, you know, we're seeing a big increase in hazards. That increase, of course, is definitely not just climate change. You know, it, it certainly has a big weather component, but there also are more people. Um, there also is more economic activity. And so that increases exposure as well. Um, but the combination of climate change and you know, growing populations and economies means more people are in companies and real estate is in harm's way. So, you know, it means that we need to get better at early warning. And um, this talk may seem concerning, but I am very hopeful and there's a lot that we can do. Um, and thinking about climate change effectively is a big part of that. So, uh, no surprise, we know that the globe is warming and global land temperatures have gone up a lot, um, perhaps by about 0.7 degrees Celsius uh, since the late 1990s, which is about the same amount of warming that you might have going all the way back to 1940, right? So, you know, part of the motivation for this drought flood fire book is this big jump after the 2015 El Nino. So, you know, just between the early 2000s and you know the late 2010s, 20 in the early 2020s, right? We've seen a, a, a lot of velocity here in terms of increase in warmth, and uh, it's important for us to think about how that warming affects hazards. And uh, one of the things that it does, and that'll be the major focus of the talk today is it warms the oceans, which in turn, you know, induce uh, through teleconnections um, increases and decreases in, in terrestrial precipitation. Um, but those are also opportunities for prediction. We know that a warmer atmosphere can hold more water, uh, contributing to more extreme precipitation events. We're certainly seeing uh, a lot of those play out even this week. And we know that a warmer atmosphere can draw more water from plants and soils, increasing the intensity of droughts. So just a quick few cartoons to kind of schematically represent this because it's important that we all get it. Um, so warmer air amplifies disasters by holding more water at a given relative humidity. Here's my little cartoon uh, of water, or sorry, of, of atmosphere, but uh, the, uh, uh, nitrogen and oxygen molecules and stuff in there. And as the parcel warms, the molecules uh, move further apart so they can hold more water vapor. You know, this is just absolutely you know, direct physics and something that we know for sure is going to happen. But this really simple, you know, fact of atmospheric physics can both intensify droughts and floods. So, uh, you know, one of the things that um, you'll be very familiar of in, in Austin and across all of the Western United States is that, you know, as air gets warmer, um, you know, the room in, inside a you know, given parcel of air near the plants, the, the surface of the earth <laughs> uh, can hold more water vapor. And so, you know, vapor pressure deficits and uh, the drawing of moisture from the leaves of plants, transpiration, and from the soil, the evaporation um, can go up. And this in turn, you know, dries out uh, plants and leads to increases in wildfire extent. And so this is California wildfire size. And, you know, there are other factors, of course, land management and lots of questions, but, you know, the science is really clear that um, when you have, you know, persistent, increases in air temperatures over time that leads to lower dead fuel moisture values and when a fire happens it can you know really grow explosively and this is something that uh, 
you know, we're certainly seeing here in California and I think our, most of the West. Warmer air holding more water can increase the frequency of intense flood events. Again, we have a cold air uh, with some water vapor in it. It rises up, the water vapor condenses, we get precipitation. You know, if you kind of keep the same dynamics, but you warm that parcel, then, you know, the sponge is bigger so that when you have, uh, you know, conditions conducive to extreme precipitation, there's just more water vapor to condense and we're seeing more extreme precipitation as a result of that. So same simple physical uh, process of increasing saturation vapor pressures, but also, you know, intensification of droughts, uh, wildfire extent and extreme precipitation. Um, but here uh, is my favorite because I'm a seasonal climate forecaster. Um, as sea surface temperatures increase in the ocean, you know, that can drive teleconnections. So here's uh, one that I work on a lot in East Africa, where you have warm sea surface temperatures near Indonesia, uh, lots of precipitation, um, and then there's dry subsiding air uh, over East Africa. And, you know, this is kind of the climatological condition, the way that things are on, on average. But when uh, there is La Nina-like climate or Indian Ocean dipole, you can see an intensification of, of this type of process, which produces droughts over uh, Eastern East Africa, all or also the Western US. And a lot of these things can be predicted. Um, so here, here's just a, a, a uh, quote that I came across when I was just looking at the recent extreme temperatures in the Western United States. Um, and this is from uh, Professor Dame Julia Slingo, who, so that means that she's like been knighted. So she's, you know, extremely well respected meteorologist, used to run uh, the UK's Met Office for many years. Um, and so, you know, in response to the flooding in Germany and the, the fires and extreme heat in the Western United States, She's saying that we really need uh, much, much better climate change models. And I agree, I think that would be great, but I think that there's a lot that we can do with the climate models that we have now if we think about their simulations in the right way. And I, I'm gonna just give a quick example related to the extreme temperatures in June. So, uh, you know, it's worth asking, you know, what is the world's most sophisticated computer? We all know that it's the human brain, right? And so one of the sort of recurring themes of this talk is that our conceptual models of climate change are, are really important if we want to anticipate and mitigate the effects, how we think about it happening. And, you know, there's a real kind of built-in tendency to think about climate change as a sort of homogeneous warming of the planet, um, but that's not what we're seeing on a, any given day or any given month. So uh, if we look at uh, a map, for example, of geopotential heights uh, for June, um, this is this last month, and these are anomalies, so difference from the 1981 to 2010 average. Oops, don't do that. Um, you know, we see, no surprise, that over uh, northwestern North America, where we have these really intense uh, air temperature anomalies, um, we have incredibly high geopotential heights. So, you know, geopotential heights are like the high pressure cells that you see on a weather map on the news, right? And that's a function of the temperature of all the air beneath it. That's just how you get a geopotential height. So what this is telling us is that, you know, between this area and the ground, the air is, is really, really much, much warmer than ever. And so, you know, rather than think about climate change as this kind of homogeneous warming, I think that in terms of kind of weather hazards and extreme heat, we should be on the lookout of, you know, for these really extreme areas of very, very high pressure that are associated with this extra heat energy moving around and collecting in certain places. Um, and related to that are these very warm sea surface temperatures uh, kind of shown off the coast, which is you know, helping to produce this ridging pattern here, um, which also may uh, amplify droughts in East Africa. But, um, and these are just a map of, of all the fires that are going on right now. 
Um, and so if we, uh, you know, think about what's causing this really extremely warm weather in northwestern North America, you know, we can see that these geopotential heights uh, in uh, 2021 and again also in 2015, you know, are just way, way warmer than the sort of historical envelope. Okay, so oops, come here. Uh, so all of a sudden we're getting this ridging that has really, as far as we know, never happened before. Um, so here I'm just showing different reanalysis products to show that this uh, is recreated very well by multiple data sets. And, you know, I think that, that if we analyze the climate change models correctly, they tell us that we should expect this. Um, so uh, to demonstrate this, I've just taken the average uh, change of a bunch of different climate change models, either the CMIP-5 ones, basically the ones used in the last IPCC report. And this would be one view of how uh, the upper atmosphere responds to climate change. It's just sort of this very kind of gradual, kind of homogeneous warming, right? Um, but uh, another way, I think this is, by the way, not the most effective way to think about climate change in terms of hazards. On the other hand, if we uh, take 33 different climate change model uh, simulations from a bunch of different models and ask how in that box over northern North America, northwestern North America, you know, what is the maximum uh, geopotential height anomaly look like, right? So, you know, when we ask, you know, like, are we going to expect to see these really big increases in geopotential heights? The answer is yes, you know. And so, um, back to to um, Julius Slinger, and you know it would be great to have faster computers, but, you know, if we don't fixate on this kind of climate change is the average of a bunch of simulations, but instead look at the individual simulations, um, they do suggest, uh, at least for things like temperature, that we should certainly expect more extremes. Um, precipitation is a little harder. So, uh, um, you know, yeah, let me skip this one. So, <laughs> so that's sort of uh, an introduction to how I think about hazards in a way that's relevant to what we're all experiencing in the Western US right now. And um, we're next gonna kind of uh, talk a little bit about, um, oh, did I, I already did this, didn't I? Mm. Sorry, these got repeated. That's good, we just gonna, Okay, sorry, this is kind of now switching back to uh, my day job, you know, working with the Famine Early Morning System Network, and we'll switch to a more of a teleconnection kind of issue. Um, and uh, right now, this is the current um, integrated phase classification map. Let me just check my time. Um, yeah, uh, for East Africa. And basically, this is an international standard that you know, allows the food security community to compare, you know, hunger conditions in Guatemala with hunger conditions in Afghanistan or Ethiopia. And, you know, uh, basically orange is, is really, really bad. You know, these are definitely people who you wanna get humanitarian assistance. Um, and then, you know, red, you want to try to avoid going into emergency, and you definitely want to prevent famine. And so, uh, you know, conflict is a big part of this. Um, Yemen has just been, you know, a food security nightmare for, for many years now, and that's, you know, related to the ongoing civil war there. Um, there was just, a you know, an outbreak uh, in of civil violence in Ethiopia, in, in Tigray in the north, and that's looking really bad. But, um, there's also been consecutive droughts in October, November, December of 2020, and then 2021 um, that have really helped push, you know, much of this region into, into food insecurity. And uh, we'll be looking at kind of a lot of rainfall results for this eastern East Africa area that I've kind of outlined in red. And then, you know, I've already kind of set the context that uh, there's been this big global increase in food insecurity. So... Um, my work uh, back in 2004 
you know, started uh, was, you know, basically I just was trying to make decent gridded rainfall data sets um, for East Africa with the, the simple logic that, you know, if you want to try to guide food aid, the first order of business is to know, you know, when you have poor rains during the growing season and, you know, an inability to put that in historical context. And in the process uh, of doing that, um, you know, kind of very routine work for the Famine Early Warning Systems Network, you know, we discovered this really declining, uh, uh, this really disturbing decline in uh, the March to September rains um, for this region shown here in orange. Um, you know, since then, many studies ha have confirmed this. And um, if we kind of show an updated map uh, produced all the way through um, yeah, 2020 and 2021, uh, you know, we see that this decline has really uh, kind of persisted. And, um, you know, the way that I have changed since 2004 to 2021 is, you know, I no longer really think about the trends, right? I think about the extreme events. And so, you know, the, the decline in East African rainfall is really produced by, you know, these really more severe droughts that are apparently worse than our best estimates of the historical record. Um, and I, I fear that we're going to be looking at um, yet another drought in 2022. And so uh, our ability to try to predict these kinds of droughts involves understanding the walker circulation. And so uh, the walker circulation um, is this global feature of uh, tropical and subtropical winds and sea surface temperatures that, you know, bring low level winds along the equator that converge here uh, near Indonesia in a place that's called the warm pool. It's very warm. The air rises and then sinks to the east and uh, to the west. And that leads to dry conditions kind of on average over eastern East Africa. You know, so you can kind of think about like, why is eastern East Africa so dry compared to like, say, uh, the Amazonia, right? And it's these dry sinking winds. Um, that also helps explain, you know, why the Western United States is dry too. So that's kind of conditions on average. <clears throat> then, you, you know, we have El Nino's, which are associated with abnormally warm water in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific and relatively cool waters over the Western Pacific. And that leads to enhanced rainfall over East Africa, um, decreased rainfall over Amazonia, and lots of other global teleconnections. And then um, we also have the sort of opposite, right? A, a La Nina, which is when we have uh, abnormally warm waters in the Western Pacific and the Western North Pacific, and relatively cool waters in the Eastern Pacific. These are things that have been, you know, studied um, for a long time, but I think that there's not enough uh, understanding around the fact that climate change is really amplifying the effects of these natural variations, creating opportunities for prediction. So, you know, here's how I think about climate change. This is just a, a simulation of uh, NASA's GIS uh, land sea temperature data set. Um, expressed as z-scores. So anything here in the dark reds, you know, are really exceptionally warm. And then on the top, I have a time series of the area of the earth that is exceptionally warm. And so, you know, basically uh, these really warm areas jump around and, you know, in the ocean, I mean, it seems look, it looks like it's fast because I just animated like 20 years of data or something, but on a climate time scale, you know, these things are, are really persistent and, you know, patterns like the one that you're looking at right here, right, uh, are used by myself and my colleagues to make uh, droughts uh, uh, predictions for East Africa, for example. Um, and, you, you know, we've seen this big jump in the, since the early 2000s of the earth that is exceptionally warm. So, you know, this is really happening quickly. 
And, but we need to be on the lookout for where these exceptionally warm sea surface temperatures are at any given time, because they offer us potential insights into prediction. So if you go back to ensembles uh, of climate change models and you see sample sea surface temperatures in the equatorial eastern Pacific and the Nino 3.4 region, and you just plot them, what you kind of really see in a very robust way is that the models predict that we're going to see these really strong uh, El Ninos like we saw in like 2015, 16, and 1997, 98. So we should be prepared for more extreme El Ninos. But at the same time, if you go into those same simulations and you look at the difference in temperatures between uh, the Western Pacific and the Eastern Pacific, this is a, a measure that I, of kind of La Nina-like climate variability, you see that that is also increasing. And so what this is telling us is that, you know, we should expect to have uh, more intense La Ninas and more intense El Ninos. And of course, there are, you know, numerous climate change papers that, that discuss this. Um, but, you know, what's kind of unique about the work that we're doing for FuseNet is that this isn't like some 2050, you know, pie in the sky kind of thing for us. This is like something that's happening right now. Uh, and the same could be said about the Indian Ocean Dipole, which I, I won't go in today. So, um, you know, what, what we've just done uh, is um, predict uh, the poor October, November, December, Eastern East African season, and then the poor 2021 March, April, May season um, for FuseNet. And, you know, basically uh, what we do for that kind of thing is, uh, this is for the March, April, May season, is, you know, we look at, uh, this is an example of January sea surface temperatures. So this is not a sea surface temperature forecast, but just the observations. And we can contrast this warm Western V region and, uh, the cool Eastern Pacific and then look at the gradient between those things. And so this Eastern Pacific region, this is the kind of La Nina pattern. And what's happening is when that happens, it's amplified by these exceptionally warm sea surface temperatures in the surrounding water. And, you know, basically uh, sea surface temperatures in the tropics map directly to uh, geopotential height differences, which in turn map to, to winds. And so gradients of sea surface temperatures, you know, change the circulation in, in predictable ways. And so, you know, in the, for these analog years, right, this is the kind of pattern um, that historically we've seen. This is the pattern that can describe the decline in the East African long rains that we discussed, but it allows us to predict the individual events. And so this is how things looked in January of 2021. And, you know, we use this as a basis for uh, unfortunately accurate forecast. So uh, we've also done work, however, looking at uh, El Nino's. So, uh, oh, sorry, this is, which, uh, yeah, sorry, this is a climate attribution study um, where we basically, you know, looked at the climate change simulations and showed that, um, and those are shown here in red, and the observations are shown in blue for the equatorial Western Pacific and the Northwestern Pacific. So, you know, the climate change models are expecting them to jump up to these exceptionally warm conditions when there's a La Nina. So there's definitely a climate change contribution, but those same climate change simulations are also, you know, predicting that we're gonna get uh, more really strong um, El Ninos. So the climate change, this is another attribution study. And so the kind of envelope of El Nino uh, sea surface temperatures uh, are shown here in this kind of blue polygon, right? And so there's been a big increase, you know, kind of already in these. And so, you know, just between like say 1990 and, you know, 2020, you know, we may be seeing like a 0.7 increase in 
Eastern Pacific uh, sea surface temperatures when there's an El Nino. And that is definitely enough to push us from a moderate El Nino to a monster El Nino. And uh, that was associated with this really severe drought in, in Ethiopia in 2015 and really severe drought in Southern Africa in 2015-16. So two phases of climate change uh, that are very hazardous, but disappear if you just average the heck out of the, the climate change simulation. So how we look at them really makes a big difference. Um, let me just take my time. Okay, doing okay. So, you know, these kinds of relationships offer us opportunities for forecasts. So, for example, here's uh, our forecast from, uh, you know, December or January of 20, 2021, where we predicted um, the poor rains from this boreal spring. Um, and the next time, we didn't do a good job on this 2015 Ethiopian drought because we were just sort of kicking off this research. But I guarantee you that the next time we're facing, uh, you know, a monster El Nino, we'll be much better, you know, prepared to do things like predict drought in northern Ethiopia associated with that. Um, so, you know, uh, these kinds of concerns, you know, um, basically led me to do a little uh, nature world view piece in, you know, uh, the fall of last year. Uh, actually, this, you know, kind of early warning became quite a bit earlier. And, you know, just saying like, hey, this is coming. We need to see this. And it's very frustrating for me <laughs> that, um, you know, that we can really anticipate these extremes quite well, but yet we're not responding proactively enough. Um, and uh, if we look at what actually happened, uh, the October, November, December rains, uh, um, our forecast is shown here and the outcome is shown here. The March, April, May rains, our forecast is here and here was the outcome. So, you know, we definitely predicted uh, these droughts, you know, way in advance. And, you know, it, you know certainly, we will sometimes be wrong, you know, but there's a lot of predictability in the climate system associated with these extremely warm sea surface temperatures. Uh, so here, basically, tomorrow at seven in the morning, you know, I'm going to be on the call um, with our colleagues from Africa, NOAA, NASA, USAID, and, you know, talking about the, the import of this map. So this is the current sea surface temperature forecasts for October, November, December of 2021. And, you know, um, what we're seeing is uh, a forecast for moderately cool Eastern Pacific sea surface temperatures. So, you know, if you were only thinking about the Eastern Pacific Nino 3.4 region, which a lot of people do, you know, you might not be very afraid for East Africa because You'd be like, okay, maybe we're going to have, you know, a kind of moderate La Nina. That's that can be bad. Um, but if you look at this map through my lens, I I see that being right next to these incredibly warm sea surface temperatures, right? That surround uh, this La Nina region. And you know, if this forecast verifies, I almost guarantee you there's going to be a drought in East Africa because these two pieces you know, work together. So uh, if we kind of look at those individual pieces and we look at these equatorial Western uh, sea surface temperatures, this is this area around Indonesia, right? This was from the forecast at this time from last year. Uh, then in 2010, uh, which was a bad drought year and, uh, uh, Oh, sorry, this is 2015 and then 2010, right? And then uh, 1999. And these were, were La Niñas that are associated with really dangerous back-to-back -back droughts in Eastern East Africa, where October, November, December, and then the March, April, May were poor, you know, and it just creates really bad food insecurity when that happens. Um, and if you just looked here, you know, at the, uh, Nino 3.4 sea surface temperatures, you might miss that. And it's really the interaction 
of these incredibly warm sea surface temperatures in the west and these moderately cool sea surface temperatures in the east that create a super strong temperature gradient. And uh, our concern right now is that that's going to happen again and that we're going to have basically two years of drought, four failed rainy seasons in an area that is facing already severe food insecurity. Um, so, uh, you know, essentially we kind of began with exceptionally warm air temperatures in Northwestern North America. And I was trying to kind of give you uh, a view of how thinking about climate change as energy moving around the climate system can help lead to successful forecasts. And, uh, you know, climate hazards are rapidly increasing, but thinking clearly about how climate change is modulating the climate systems open the door of prediction. And there is a lot that we can do to help each other safeguarding lives and livelihoods. Um, here's just a figure from uh, my first ever blog from October of 2016, which was yet another, uh, that was sort of a, <laughs> Uh, a drought prediction, it, basically at exactly this time of year that we're looking at now and here in 2021. And, you know, one of the figures in there um, that I showed was this sort of population bomb graphic that I've created. And, and if, you know, basically, you know, we're living through this period uh, of modernity here. This is all the people in billion, in people years, you know, between 1960 and, uh, 19, sorry, 2040. Okay. And so there's going to be this incredible amount of human activity that you'd have to go back to 1000 AD and then, or from between 1000 to like 1500 AD. Right. So, um, you know, what's fueling climate change is this incredible activity, but that incredible activity can also help us do a lot, both to fight climate change and to help each other. And so uh, I'll end with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris. That was uh, really uh, fascinating and, and uh, really like your emphasis on conceptual understanding of climate change, because I think a lot of times we just think of averages and stuff. Um, uh, I think uh, there are some uh, questions in the uh, chat. And um, uh, Ramon, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, I actually, uh, thank you, uh, Christopher. That was really interesting talk. Um, I actually wrote the question uh, before you continued. It, it seemed like you answered some of that, the uh, teleconnections. Uh, I think it was called a walker. Uh, circulation. Yeah. Circulation, yeah. But I noticed early on in your talk that it seemed uh, like some of the years of drought in Eastern Africa sort of coincidentally um, match some of the years of drought and extreme heat that we had here um, in South Central North America. Um, so I, I was just curious, is that just, you know, coincidence or is there some connection no, there? Yeah, yeah. And I think I think it, it definitely, you know, there is, I think, a, um, it, at least in some times of the year, you know, a pretty strong link between La Nina climate or La Nina-like climate and you know, drought across uh, you know, the, the southern US and the south central US. And so I think that's, that is, um, you know, basically, you know, it, it, climate doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And I think that you're definitely seeing um, you know, a similar kind of teleconnection pattern. So you know, when, when there is this, this so basically, um, you know, when there's a, a La Nina-like kind of climate condition, then you get enhanced precipitation uh, in the area around Indonesia. And in that sense, um, these barotropic Rosby waves downstream, and that can dry out the South Central uh, United States and help produce really warm temperatures. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, uh, thanks, Ramon. Uh, so Wala Ali has a question also. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I have a question about uh, when I following your uh, models, I was, I was um, uh, curious about if you did any, or if you did um, 
any research or you find any relationship between the prediction of climate models and the movement of the plates? Have you find any relations? I, I, I haven't really looked at that. And, you know, I have to say that kind of as a climate hazard scientist, you know, I'm, I'm interested in climate change, but really only like in the next decade or maybe most 30 years out, you know, so I, I really haven't kind of looked at, at really long time scales relevant to okay. that question. Okay, I'm, thanks so much. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So, um, Chris, uh, just to uh, uh, anybody, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. But in the meantime, I just want to. So, in California, is the climate strongly linked to uh, Enso? Or, I mean, then uh, I see Mike Dettinger saying that maybe 70 or 80% of the precip in California is related to atmospheric rivers. And, you know, so there are other. Uh, and and uh, the papers I'd read in the past, they didn't find a strong linkage with El Nino uh, conditions or whatever. Would be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. You know, and again, um, I would certainly <laughs> defer to my my friend Mike Dettinger on that. And yeah, you know, like, and again, just to kind of expand on that, like, um, you know, uh, you know, Mike and, and and others down at San Diego have done some great work, also showing how. You know, for most places in California, you know, like, I don't know, like 80% of the precipitation will come in seven days, you know, so it's really, uh, yeah, whether they're atmospheric river events or just these intense precipitation, yeah, it is, it can be really hard because they are, um, you know, just tied to these, you know, very uh, intense, short-lived precipitation events, you know, whereas I think, you know, climatically, in some ways, East Africa may be, you know, somewhat more similar to South Central North America, which has a monsoonal climate. And so I think that the, the ENSO signal is stronger in the South Central than it is generally in, in California. Um, but, but however, you know, again, I'm not a, I'm not a Western US, you know, uh, expert, but, but I, I have friends who are and like Sasha Gershinov down at, down at Scripps definitely thinks that he can used, you know, Pacific sea surface temperatures to make skillful forecasts, you know, that aren't always right, but they have kind of useful skills. So it's not necessarily just ENSO, but, you know, I do think, um, you know, we have seen a lot of uh, exceptional, uh, you know, North Pacific sea surface temperatures over the last, you know, 20 years. And I think those can be used to, to guide at least somewhat skillful forecasts. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Chris? I see. Oh, okay. I, do, I see. Maybe, yeah. Do you want to let Will ask that question? Oh, Hi, please go ahead. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, my question is related um, to the degree of interest that you may have um, for current climate predictions or near term climate predictions to understand the history of global responses to past extreme weather events. Um, that can be found within geologic records? Yeah, so, you know, um, again, this is um, beyond what, but, but what I do, but certainly, um, you know, there's lots of great work being done in paleoclimate, um, you know, using tree rings and uh, like uh, coral reef isotopes, things like that, um, both in the United, Western United States and, you know, in East Africa, the two areas that, that I'm most familiar with. Um, and, you know, so like for the Western US, this has really helped, you know, reinforce this idea that this is a, you know, a, a kind of millennial scale drift towards drier conditions in terms of the historical record. Um, and there's some work in East Africa that, that points towards similar conclusions. Um, but, you know, another, another component I think out of that work that it really adds a lot of value um, is like even kind of setting climate change aside. You know, I think if you look at that data for the Western United States or for Eastern Africa, you know, you see lots of, uh, you know, low frequency variability, you know, related to probably the Pacific sea surface temperatures. And so, you know, even without climate change, you know, we're living in these kind of areas that are kind of drought prone due to the strong teleconnections that we have to the Pacific Ocean. 
Yeah, and I think uh, Tim Shannon and Kerry Cook uh, might, have, uh, especially Tim in West Africa, have done some work at UT on, on those aspects. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, Bridget, I have a question here. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, the, uh, given the, the predictability of uh, the droughts in uh, Africa, um, I see you have used um, CSS temperatures a lot uh, as a precursor for uh, forecasting droughts. How about you use um, the uh, soil moisture conditions from satellites and uh, also uh, land cover, um, and like a leaf phenology, etc., from the um, regions, uh, and as uh, additional predictors to help improve the predictability of the droughts. Um, are you uh, doing that, or are you aware of anyone else doing this? Yeah. So we are. I mean, we're collaborators with. Um, uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center Hydrologic Modeling Group uh, at NASA, and they're doing that kind of work. So it's this NASA hydrologic forecast system, NIFAS, where they're taking, um, you know, the Earth system model, the land information system, and you know, it's probably not capturing everything you just described, but it is, you know, certainly starts with soil moisture and, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some approximations for the vegetation conditions. And, you know, and then it's not, it, it, and then it kind of you know, uses that to make future forecasts driven with uh, climate model forecasts. Um, so that does, get at what you're describing to some degree. Um, I think, and so that would capture like things like persistence of soil moisture anomalies and things like that. What, and, and maybe air temperature feedbacks. Um, what, it, what it wouldn't get would be things like, uh, you know, land atmosphere feedbacks that might, you know, modulate a monsoon. And so, you know, maybe that'll, you know, that to kind of come back to um, Dame Julian Slingo, I mean, that maybe is where we will be in 20 years with that kind of capacity, um, but we're, we're not there yet. Um, thanks, Liang. Um, I think uh, Byron Tapley said a couple of decades ago from Center for Space Research that uh, the vegetation uh, could uh, function as a precipitation gauge network in Africa because the gauge network was so poor and the vegetation was so responsive to the climate. So he, he's one of the people that developed the Gray Satellite uh, mission. Um, so if there are no other questions, then um, maybe we thank uh, Chris uh, for giving an excellent presentation. And uh, Chris, if you see on the line, then Ashraf and I would like to chat. So Sounds thanks everybody wonderful. for joining us.